Hi everybody. I thought we'd do something a bit different today. As you can see, we, we're outdoors and it's a beautiful, lovely summer morning. A couple of months ago, in Zimbabwe, a man by the name of Samson Chikarema passed away. He was the first high-ranking ZANU PF official to succumb to this dreaded COVID pandemic that's sweeping the world. And speaking after his passing, the president of Zimbabwe said, this was a kind man, this was a good man, this was a man who loved peace. Well, when we hear words like that, uh, naturally we feel sympathetic. But then the president went on to say, it was only his love of peace that drove him to war. Ah, that's a pity. It rather spoils things in a way. What war would that be? Well, the Rhodesian Bush War, of course. Samson Chikarema is better known by his Chimorenga name of Perence Shiri. Now, Shiri is a man who is famous for a, for a great many things. But I'm sorry to say that for the most part, uh, they are not good things that he is remembered for. According to the BBC, he is reported to have described himself as a black Jesus. Like the Saviour, he is reported to have said, uh, I can let people live or I can let people die. It all depends how I feel. Um, and he was true to his word. After Mugabe came to power, uh, Shiri was uh, appointed colonel in charge of the 5th Brigade. This was uh, a ZANU PF military force trained by North Korean communists. And um, they marched into Matabili land, if you like, uh, with a quest of quelling an uprising there. There were dissidents that needed to be dealt with. But in actual fact, uh, it, it was payback time. In the good old days before the uh, arrival of the white man, the Matabili uh, ran amok. They pillaged, they plundered, they raped uh, Mashona land. But now the white man was gone again and the tables were turned. And so Zanu PF, the 5th Brigade, uh, massacred brutally about 20,000 people in Matabili land. So you can be sure there were no tears shed at the news of Shiri's passing in that part of Zimbabwe. And if there were tears, they would have been tears of joy. I think we can say with a great deal of confidence the fact that Shiri is still lying in the grave after all this time. Uh, <laughs> is evidence enough that this man was in no way divine. But there is a point to all this and there's a reason why I'm talking about him and I'll get back to it a bit later. But first I'd like uh, to take you to quite a, a well-protected complex and I would like very much uh, to show you the place. Okay, this is it. Judging by the vegetation that hasn't been cut back, I think we might safely conclude that this place is for all intents and purposes abandoned. It's an old fuel depot. Just uh, take a look at the protection around it. Concrete wall, sentry boxes, barbed wire, electric fence. There's a lot of other things beside. But how effective would all this have been in the face of an attack by a determined enemy? Take a look in the background. Do you see that high feature there? More or less dominates the area. It seems to me to have been well in range of 120 millimeter Russian mortar uh, and in its day it would have caused havoc um, amongst these tanks here. The, the pointers. It's very difficult to protect uh, installations like this and it reminds me a lot of the Salisbury fuel depot and uh, that's really the focus of our movie today. So I'm, I'm between call-ups and it's about nine o'clock at night when I get a telephone call from a friend of mine who owns a transport company. 
uh, he tells me that he's just had a call from the security guard to say that there's a fire in the vicinity. So my friend asks me, could he come pick me up? Uh, would I go with him? And if necessary, help him to move some of the, the vehicles out of the way. He says to me that he's bringing the blue job with. Now the blue job was a mutual friend of ours uh, from the Air Force, a wonderful man. And so uh, a few minutes later, the two of them arrive at my front door and we uh, pile into an open pickup truck and we head off for the Southerton Industrial Sites. And as we are driving along, I can see that there's quite a sizable blaze uh, over in that direction. And we get closer and um, I'm aware of the fact that the streets uh, all seem to be strangely deserted. We leave the Beatrice Road, go down a side street, and then we catch a right at uh, Birmingham Road and we travel in the direction of all things the fuel depot because it's, it's apparent by now that this is where the blaze is. Uh, I just felt my heart sink. I mean, I and I'm sure many, many others and driven past that place probably a hundred times and asked ourselves, I wonder, uh, are the gooks not going to hit this place one day? It seemed such an inviting target. It seemed that it had happened now. What a scene. I have uh, no adequate words uh, to describe the sight that met my eyes there. Every single photograph and every bit of film footage that I've seen since then has never done justice to that inferno. It was an unbelievable believable scene. It would rain the next day, but that night it seemed as though the very clouds in the heavens had descended just above head height. There was an orange glow everywhere, and uh, one could almost feel the heat as we drew closer uh, to this inferno. And then, of all things, I saw a solitary soldier walking purposefully up the road uh, toward us and we slowed down and stopped and uh, he came across uh, to speak to us. One man, the nationalists make a big thing uh, today of the fact that that fuel depot was the most closely guarded financial asset of the Rhodesian government. Uh, it was nothing of the sort. And here's this, here's this man, camouflage t-shirt, PT shorts, a radio on his back, so he was obviously a section leader. I couldn't see where his men were, down in the distance at the intersection of Paisley Road. It looked like there were some figures moving there, but uh, they were so far away I couldn't determine for sure that this was the rest of his men. But he asked us uh, what we were doing there and uh, he told us that he couldn't let us through. Uh, we explained to him that uh, we had a problem, that there were some trucks that we were uh, scared might get uh, damaged and we wanted to move them. And he said, listen guys, I don't really know what's going on here. Uh, I don't even know whether the people that did this are still in the vicinity. They might be down uh, side streets, for all I know. I can't let you through. Forget about the trucks. I'd rather lose your trucks than lose your lives. Because I could see that um, if he didn't have his hands full at that moment, he certainly would have before much longer. And so we turned around. We actually went down Paisley Road to Beatrice Road, and we pulled off, and we stopped. And we just looked at the site unbelievable and then one by one uh, we would see and hear more explosions as one tank after the other went off. I, I forget now how many it was I think there was something like about 25 tanks uh, out of 32 if I'm not mistaken that were destroyed that night and as we were sitting there in the vehicle looking at this and and you know just trying to come to terms with it in our minds a small crowd gathered from a nearby African township and they were silent to begin with. Uh, and then when one of the tanks went up, uh, they started cheering and, and clapping. And uh, the blue job uh, jumped out of the vehicle and uh, called over to them. Hey, what are you cheering for? Don't you understand that that's your livelihood that's going up there? That's the, the bread and butter that you put on the table for your families. And I could see uh, in the crowd that there were a number of uh, heads that nodded uh, in agreement. They understood that. But there were others, I'm um, uh, um, sad to say, who uh, started shouting back at the blue job. And uh, I could hear things like, Nyarara uh, Iwe, in other words, shut up. And Tatora uh, Nika, loosely translated, uh, we are taking over the country. 
And um, he shouted back at them, but what do you mean taking over the country? You want to take over the country that's burnt down to the ground? What are you going to do with it? Who's going to rebuild it for you? And uh, there were more insults that were hurled back at him. And I said, um, oh, just forget it. Let's, let's go. And uh, so we drove off. And uh, man, did that place burn. It burnt for days. Uh, our fire department couldn't put it out. Uh, we were fortunate enough to get help from South Africa. Uh, they sent some specialists up here, and they eventually got the fire under control. But uh, what a blaze, what a blaze. A lot of folk uh, today, uh, commentators and historians, will say that that was the turning point. It was that that uh, brought about the capitulation of, uh, of the white man in Rhodesia, but it did nothing of the sort. I mean, every single family there had men serving in the armed forces in, in one branch or one division or another. And uh, uh, certainly we were all well aware of what was going on in the country from a security point of view. Um, and it wasn't the first time that we had heard gunfire and seen violence uh, in the city. I mean, there'd been bombings before that. So it's not true to say that that actually uh, broke the morale of Rhodesian society. It did nothing of the sort. Uh, but it was a loss. I mean, one can't deny that. It was millions of liters of fuel uh, that went up there. A really uh, tragic event, uh, really sad uh, that so much damage uh, could be caused uh, in such a few uh, minutes. The conflict in Rhodesia was between two opposing sides. On the one hand, you had the Rhodesian security forces, and on the other, the so-called Patriotic Front, which comprised of two nationalist armies, Zipra and Zanla. Of course, the question is, which of these two carried out the attack on the field depot? Just recently, a previous commander uh, with the Zipra uh, forces published an article uh, and he gave some details of how they carried out the attack. And he said it was planned in Lusaka, and um, it consisted of a small four-man team led by a comrade Quattro. And they first uh, crossed into the country uh, at Kariba, and then moved into the Musengezi African uh, farming lands. And uh, from there, they were assisted by a black farmer uh, who provided transport and they were able to to come into Salisbury. Uh, they then spent some time uh, doing a reconnaissance uh, of the fuel depot. Uh, they were based up in various houses in Mafakozi, Kambazuma and in Arari Township. And um, one of the sympathizers that they stayed with uh, knew a taxi driver with uh, Rixi Taxis and uh, the plan was that uh, they would make use of this man and his taxi and a friend of his who would provide a further taxi and this would convey the men from the townships to the fuel depot. And so accordingly, uh, one evening, they um, loaded their weapons into these two taxis and uh, proceeded uh, into uh, the Southerton uh, industrial sites. The taxi drivers were unaware of the intentions of their passengers. The um, taxis were stopped adjacent to the fuel depot and uh, two of the men uh, in the front taxi climbed out um, and immediately from the side of the road uh, opened up on the fuel depot hitting two of the tanks. They immediately climbed back, back into the taxi and um, they drove off down Glasgow Road and eventually through various detours made their way uh, to Norton and from there to a railway siding where the uh, taxis were told that they were free to return but that they shouldn't uh, talk about what they had seen. Uh, the group then made their way on foot back to Musengezi. Unfortunately for them, one of the taxi drivers so excited by the whole event of the evening, couldn't keep his mouth shut. And he started talking about it. And uh, whoever heard his story uh, went and repeated it to others. And it wasn't long before a special branch paid a visit to 
the townships and started arresting people that uh, were involved in this. And under questioning, they discovered that these men were from Musengezi and that they had returned there. And so immediately, uh, a military operation was uh, put into place uh, involving the Grey Scouts. And they swept backwards and forwards through that uh, farming area until they located the spoor and then uh, found this group of, of gooks. Uh, a contact ensured, uh, two insurgents were killed, uh, quattro amongst them, and two of them managed to escape. And um, when, I, when I read this, uh, it made sense to me. Uh, that is exactly how I understood Zipra. I, um, I have no doubt in my mind that um, the whole story was very credible. Um, I never thought when I saw that um, inferno there in the industrial sites uh, that it was caused by Zanla. Um, they were not regarded in any way as being uh, specialized, as being capable of doing anything sophisticated. In fact, my platoon commander never just said the word Zanla. It was always Zanla riffraff. And I think it's true to say that that is how most of us as soldiers regarded them. However, <clears throat> um, there is an interesting uh, alternative story. And uh, it comes from none other than Perrin Sheri. And uh, he tells a completely different story. He says Zipra had nothing to do with this. It was entirely a Zandla operation. And what he says was that there was a meeting held in Mozambique in the Tet province and a number of gooks got together and they said, look, we, let, let's go and do something. Let's get up to some mischief over there in Rhodesia that will really embarrass the government and, and, and you know, serve as a good slap in the face to them. And uh, initially the idea was to go and bomb the sewerage works in Salisbury. But um, a, a lady who was present at the meeting uh, thought that this was not a good idea and she voiced her concerns and then she suggested why don't they rather attack the petrol depot and um, this was met with enthusiasm and what they did was they thought well we'll get a specialized team together to do this but they knew it was very risky so she says they paraded everybody when they got all the gundangas in this particular camp together on the parade square, they started off uh, by carrying out a selection process. And the first thing they said was, all of you who are women, fall out. And that left a considerable number of men still standing there. They then said, those of you who have never been to Salisbury, fall out. And so that left a, s a smaller group. Those of you who know the area of Harare Hospital, which was near the, the, the fuel depot. Stay behind. The rest of you fall out. And so this group dwindled and dwindled each time. And then there was the last bunch of people standing there. And Shiri says, because this task was almost suicidal, we then said, all of you who do not smoke a bungee fall out. <laughs> so there were a handful of people left, uh, drug addicts, who had been to Salisbury, who knew the hospital area, who spoke Shona, and uh, these were the men that were selected for the task. And so they were sent into the country uh, with their weapons and explosives and things and uh, duly made their way to Salisbury. And then the story is much the same as what Zipra says. There were some taxis involved, there were some safe houses um, in the African townships, and then um, on a particular day, these two taxis were used to convey uh, the gooks to the fuel depot. Now, it's <laughs> one ought not to read too much into the Chimorenga names of these people. But they are interesting, at least they are to me. Um, they were like little 
one or two word uh, autobiographies, if you like, of how the man saw himself in the war and how he wanted to be remembered. And so amongst this group of, of terrorists tasked with uh, destroying the fuel depot were one or two interesting names. There was um, a comrade No Rest, <laughs> the poor man. Uh, there was another comrade Take Time. There was another comrade uh, called Comrade Poison. And um, for me, the most interesting was uh, a Comrade Damage Bombs. <laughs> I don't know how you damage a bomb and survive it, but, but maybe he meant uh, he was going to cause damage with bombs. At any rate, this, uh, this group uh, arrived there, got out of the taxi, and then Comrade No Rest um, took a rocket launcher and took aim at a petrol tank. Now, I just need to say that a few days prior to that, some of them had rocked up at the front gate of the, of the fuel depot, according to, to Shiri, of course. They arrived there and said, we are school teachers from Seki, and we want to do a project with our school children and explain all about the economy. And it would be so nice for us if we could walk through this fuel depot and have something to tell them at, that we have seen it firsthand. And the security guard welcomed them in. And they walked around and they asked what is in there, what is in there. And so they knew very well what was petrol and what was diesel. So no rest uh, takes aim at the petrol tank. Huge structure. Uh, you can't miss it. Uh, but he does, I suppose, because he's eye on Dacha. And uh, never mind, the rocket hits a diesel tank uh, with much the same effect. Tremendous boom, and the thing catches a light, and the fire spreads very quickly um, from one to the other. They, in the meantime, hightail it out of there. The taxis take them to a certain point. Um, they then write a letter to the owner of Rixie Taxis, uh, telling him that uh, it's not the driver's fault that these vehicles were commandeered by Zandler, and um, putting a bullet in with a letter for him as authentication that they really were gooks. And uh, two of them stayed behind in the country because they felt their work wasn't finished, and the others made their way back to Mozambique to a rowdy welcome. Everybody was so happy because the news had preceded them uh, that the, the depot had been destroyed. Well, uh, you take your pick of either of those two stories. The point is nobody knows which is the truth. Now, learned men have found this whole subject quite fascinating. In fact, uh, Mr. Warada did a doctorate thesis in history on this whole thing. Spent uh, a great deal of time researching it. And you can find it on the internet. If you look for it, you'll find it. Uh, fascinating reading. And despite all his efforts at trying to establish who blew up this depot, he says at the end, <laughs> He doesn't know. There's no source material. It's just two stories. Uh, all we can say for sure is it must have been somebody from the Patriotic Front. But who and how it was done, we don't know. So, it's a bit of a mystery. That's one of the greatest things that befell our country. Nobody knows who did it. Um, do yourself a favor if you haven't done so yet. Go on YouTube. Please pay John a visit and, uh, and see what he has there. In the meantime, keep well, take care, stay safe. Cheers.